According to Dr. Google, it is 5.30. This is the City Council work meeting, April the 17th, 2024, and it's 5.30. The City Council meeting is being held at the Chambers, City Chambers office at 10 North Main Street. We're honored once again to have Father Adrian Komar from Christ the King Catholic Church, Church to lead us in prayer, after which we're honored to have Trish Coleman, who will lead us in the pledge. Father. Almighty God and Father, we are standing before you with open hearts, ready to listen what you want to tell us. We want to thank you for the great gifts that we receive every day. We want to thank you that you allow us to live in a peaceful place. We pray as we remember all the people who suffer because of the war, especially in Ukraine and Israel. Almighty God, send your peace upon the world. Make us also those who will support the peace and who can work for the good of every single person. <coughs> We ask you because you are Lord who lives forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you're a veteran, I invite you to salute the flag, and if not, then put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Gentlemen, we have an agenda before us. Mayor, I would move that we approve the agenda order as outlined. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, I would like to publicly and personally make a, a gesture of thank you to Jonathan Stathis here at the end of the, the table. He is, is uh, moving out to the water department, the water rights department. He has been with the city 23 forever. 23 year. years. Yeah, 23 years. And and has been an absolutely amazing man with so much talent uh, in so many ways and, and, a, and a gentleman and a kind person to everyone. And I personally would like to thank you for your many, many years of service and to wish you the very best as you move on. And if you want to be on television one more time, you can say anything you want. <laughs> well, I'll 23 years ago, um, Joe Melling and Kit Wareham hired me. Um, they took a chance on a very young and inex inexperienced engineer. Um, but I'm so grateful that I've had this opportunity. It's been an amazing journey for me. Um, every day is, has been a new challenge. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the greatest people I've ever met. In, in the world, really. Um, all the council members I've worked with, the mayors, and especially all the staff have just been wonderful to work with, and I'm, I'm very blessed. I've been very blessed to be able to work for Cedar City for the past 23 years, and I'm definitely going to miss everyone, and, um, but I appreciate the opportunity that I had. Um, the mentors and the people that I've worked with have just been amazing, and I'm very grateful. Um, and I think back on the just all the different projects I've been able to work on. It's it's been an amazing journey for me, and I I'm very grateful. Thank you, Thank Jonathan. You. <clears throat> the city is uh, much richer because of your contributions. There's not a person sitting in this room that hasn't been affected by your work because of all you've done in terms of engineering streets and sewer systems and water lines and commercial developments and schools and everything else. And uh, 
I, for one, am deeply thankful for the great inspiration you've been to me and the great mentor and how you've helped me channel these last six and a half years to try and understand things better. And uh, I just really have appreciated working with you. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. The city is grateful for your service. Um, we have a, a presentation from the reefs across America. Presentation of gentlemen, if you would like to come forward and make your presentation. Good evening, my name is Harold Frazier. I'm the commander, District 7, Cedar City American Legion Department of Utah. On behalf of the American Legion, Cedar City Post 74 has some of our members here present today to honor Scott Phillips and Wreaths Across America. The mission of Wreaths Across America is to remember the fallen, honor those who serve, and teach the next generation the value of freedom. While we have Veterans Day in the fall and Memorial Day in the spring, our servicemen and women sacrifice their time and safety every single day of the year to preserve our freedoms. In American homes, every day, there's an empty seat for one who is serving or one who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country and never came home. That is why the Wreaths Across America mission to remember, honor, and teach lasts all year long, far beyond a single day in September when we coordinate in December when we coordinate <laughs> wreath laying ceremonies. All throughout the year, Wreaths Across America works in a number of ways to show our veterans and their families that we will not forget. We will never forget. Volunteers are the beating heart of this patriotic program and work year round to share this important mission and inspire others to join. Scott Phillips has taken upon himself to lead the Wreaths Across America program here in Cedar City. Scott's dedication and sacrifice to make Wreaths Across America an honorable tribute to Iron County's veterans and their families deserve recognition. American Legion Cedar City Post 74 would like to present Scott Phillips with a well-deserved certificate of appreciation. John Finn, the past commander of Post 74, will do the honor. Oh my God. This is not on the agenda. <laughs> no. It was intentionally not on the agenda. They wanted to see the look on your face. Uh, and we presented this to you. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm speechless. I'm not usually speechless. <laughs> you see? Wow. Oh, wow. Thank you. What an honor. Uh, I wanted to read a, a, an invitation. We've been, we've been blessed to have these uh, pictures about the Topaz experience and over by Delta for the last several weeks in our, in our hallway and also here in the chambers. This will change on the 24th of April at 1 p.m. Uh, when we will be honored with a traveling exhibit from the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. Uh, the Utah uh, Arts and Museums was created in 1899 and is celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. As part of this celebration, we are traveling an ex exhibition that highlights some of the works of art in the state of Utah. Alice Merrill Home Art Connection Collection, 125 years of collecting, will be exhibited at the Cedar City Hall from April the 24th through May the 28th. Donna Law, Executive Director of the Utah Department of Culture and Community Engagement, will speak along with Fletcher Booth, Traveling Exhibit Manager, and there will be some cookies. Uh, we invite you to come and see what they're going to hang up. 
in our hallway in our chambers and it should be interesting and you get a cookie. Also on the 23rd, the day before at 12 o'clock noon, there will be a uh, groundbreaking at the Canyon Park. The Rotary Club has been preparing for some time to make some changes there in the park and that will take place on the 23rd. That's a Tuesday. Uh, that is my business, council members. May I just have a couple of brief things? Um, thank you for reading that uh, information about the art exhibit. I'm happy to let people know because I, one time I served as the chair of the Utah Arts Council Board. Uh, we were the first arts council in the nation, Utah was. So I think it's a real tribute to the, the people and the heritage of our state that they saw the value of the arts when they were struggling to make livings and put food on the table, they saw the importance of music and art and theater and dance, and so it's a real tribute, and so that's great. The other thing I wanted to do is it, this just came out in the Desert News today, and uh, you may have already seen it, Mayor and others, but uh, Utah um, was rated the top state for small business in the nation and leading the less best places for small businesses in the nation is Cedar City. We've Cedar City is noticed. number one. We beat St. George. They came <laughs> in number two. And then it goes on to places in Idaho and Lehigh and Coeur d'Alene and Bozeman. But Cedar City is the number one city in America for small business. And I think that was for, I read that same article, it was Wallet Hub that yep. did the study, and it was for cities between 25 and 100,000. Yeah, population. small cities. Small mm -hmm. cities. Yep. yep. That was all, Mayor. Thank you very little much. Little bragging rights there. Little bragging rights, yep. Yeah, we've noticed out on Main Street, haven't we? Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Um, thank you. Other council members? Anything from the Youth Council tonight? No. <laughs> Surprise. Um, thank you. Uh, staff, comments? We will begin, uh, we're going to have a presentation, something of some traffic study results, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Darren Adams with the Police Department and Council. Um, so we have, uh, I'm going to give the glory to Dr. Park and his students. We engaged in a traffic study with them uh, dating back to December. And uh, the idea was is to try to do what we can to prevent traffic accidents at many of our busiest intersections in town. And so um, we appreciate the partnership with Dr. Park and all of the students that did the work. And uh, this is one of many that we've engaged with them over the years. And we see a, a mutual benefit. And so we're, we appreciate that. So we'll turn the time over to Dr. Park to introduce. Oh, hello. Yeah, uh, my name is Seng Jun Park. And uh, I'm an assistant professor of uh, criminal justice and working at the Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice. So, uh, Cedar City Police Department and our department uh, have strong partnership doing like uh, researches. So this time our research is like uh, prevent crashes in Cedar City, and this project is uh, funded by uh, Department of Tra uh, Department of Transportation and Public Safety. So you probably noticed that there are like uh, active police patrol in high crash locations. So. Our students actually evaluate the prevention, like uh, intervention, and they will share their research findings. And yeah. My name is Herman Rodriguez. My name is Day Coles. My name is Emma Eccles. And my name is Anthony Wright. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so our goal with this study was to keep our community safer and reduce crashes in Cedar City. We did this with some criminological theory, um, theories the, the of community policing, hotspot policing, <coughs> and proactive patrol. Community policing means it's not just our officers who are out there doing the work. We have members from the community, uh, volunteers in police services, and they were a great help during this whole process. Hotspot policing, this theory suggests that very small area, like small number of areas account for 
about 80% of all crimes, and in this case, traffic violations and crashes in a given area. Proactive patrol <coughs> means that we're not reacting to it. We're sending officers and volunteers to these areas before crashes happen. Next slide, please. This is just kind of a map of our hotspots that we identified and the peak times. If you can see kind of close, the numbers are small. The highest number of crashes happened between 3 and 5 o'clock. At 3, there were 141. And very few crashes on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday. It was all mainly Monday through Friday. We did this study with proactive patrol from our police officers and our volunteers. Six hotspots were identified and chosen for our intervention. We sent our officers and volunteers there between 3 and 5 p.m. And we, our current data is from the 11th of December to the April 11th. And our current calls for service data that we use to compare this research finding with before is from December 11th to March 4th. We looked at four types of offenses that we found in our call for service data. They were PI accidents, which are personal injury in which one of the drivers or pedestrians have been injured in a crash. PD accidents are damage accidents, so they are damage to the buildings or just the cars themselves. Hit and run, someone hit vehicle, person, parking lot or anything and they just ran away. And traffic offense is just speeding or running through a red line, improper turns, things of that nature. <coughs> We had our officers and volunteers collect this data with our log file, and that kind of just, we had them record the speeds of the area, the weather of the area, and just overall traffic fluctuations in the area. So this intersection that I was uh, focusing on is Highway 56 and 200 North, um, and where it meets with Airport Road as well as College Way. Um, some possible causes that I found out after our studies. Um, obviously, this is an infamous intersection in the county. Um, it is, if, if you're out on that part of town, you know how busy you can get at various parts of the day. Um, so many of the possible ca causes that we discovered were just generic speeding off of Highway 56 coming into town, short left-hand turns, and driver distraction. Um, some recommendations for prevention. Having had experienced the intervention in this area firsthand, I think it's effective and does work. Um, if you are in this area th throughout the times of 3 and 5 p.m., you'll notice a few officers that are on Highway 56 just doing some generic patrolling. I I've, wit I've witnessed it myself firsthand, and I have seen the drivers in the area also slow down um, because of that. So, yeah, just more standard policing and some beneficial speed signs that could possibly be beneficial for the area. Sorry, that was a mouse. <laughs> um, this hotspot is also infamous for um, crashes in the fall and winter time, 94.26 to be specific. Um, so we're seeing a lot of accidents that are happening there in the winter and in the Excuse fall. Excuse me, are you saying that 94% of all the accidents that happen there happen in the fall and the winter? The fall or winter time okay. throughout those months. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and 24% of them occur between 7 and 11 p.m. So there's a lot of um, recommendations that can be used in this area, just more generic patrolling throughout the day outside of the times of 3 and 5 p.m., um, but also taking into looking at the data of why it's more specifically in the wintertime. Uh, next slide, please. The second one that I was assigned was Providence Center Drive and Royal Hunt, um, where it in intercrosses with Cross Hollow Road. Um, this intersection is also another infamous one. Um, having seen many of the overall accidents, this is the hot spot. A lot of the accidents that we got in our data came from here. Um, possible causes include just generic driver speeding, left-hand turns in unsafe areas, and many reported calls for hits and for hit and runs, which may be to the high influx of commercial and retail that's in the area. Road design also plays a factor for our out-of-town people who don't understand the diamond interchange. Um, the intervention seems to be working pretty well as well. Um, in this area, if you're there between 3 and 5 p.m., I'm like giving you where the like, officers are going to be hiding, but I've noticed them. Um, <laughs> th th they'll be over by Walgreens and over kind of by like the Chipotle area, but it is effective and it does work, um, and it keeps the drivers kind of alert to, and reminds them of that the area is commercial. Um, this hotspot is monitored by police. 23.32% of the incidents occur at this hotspot between 3 and 5 p.m., um, and only one incident has been reported since the intervention has began in this area, 
which is good out, a good impact um, due to its history that it has had before. Um, so yeah, that is it for me. Hmm. So hotspot three, um, this this is where 200 North and Main Street that in that intersection, um, with it being some main roads within town, there's a lot of traffic <laughs> that goes through. Like when you go from place to place in Cedar City, these are the main roads you usually use to get through them. So it causes it to be very populated, um, visited a lot, so it becomes very busy. And, s and because of the Linz market there, it just it's a busy area. And because of the populated area, that's one of the reasons why it's so, um, why it's such a hot spot. It also has the burger alley down the one way going down the 200. That's my favorite spot. So I can, <laughs> there's like a lot of crashes right there when you're coming in. And then one of our focuses were on the area where you come out from the back way of the post office. There is a lot of, there was one crash right there because nobody's paying attention. No one's like looking for oncoming cars and everybody's going fast down that street. So all the crashes are happening because no one's being <coughs> cautious of other cars and the speed limit. Um, there's only, I've noticed there's the speed limit, but it's further down the street next to McDonald's instead of closer up to the street. So a recommendation could be putting a precaution sign like, hey, slow down before you're zooming down this street coming past the school. Um, or also um, for the cars coming out of those small little streets, like such as the back row for the post office, we can think about like saying, hey, watch out for flying cars as well to protect their cars as well as they're merging onto the main street. So in this hot spot, this hot spot is monitored by police and volunteers. And only one of the accidents that happened after the intervention happened during the, during the time of three and five. And it was logged in as a rear end accident. And the other one was recorded before the intervention time. Um, so hotspot number four, this is 3000 North and Main. Um, this is where the freeway exit in, and entrance, and it causes a lot of visitor traffic, especially when people stop at the gas station right there at that intersection. Um, along with the fact that 3000 North is a long road with hardly any traffic in buildings, which may cause a tendency for people driving this road to speed, especially with that um, curve in the road, it's also hard to see that stoplight when you're coming up to it. So <coughs> possible solutions to this might be putting up signs, warning signs of the stoplight coming up or slow down signs um, on, on all four streets to signify <coughs> the stoplight coming up. Um, there were three crashes that occurred in this area during de December 11th and March 4th, um, March 4th, I believe. And um, this, they both happened while the, volunteers were not there so hmm. <coughs> so the next hot spot we have is 600 south main street this is like my favorite main street uh street to take in general because i do a lot of back roads and this is right in front of the smith's gas station but also right next to joanne's i shop there a lot so it's very infamous for teenagers and college students when we're driving, especially with like weather conditions in the fall time and in the winter time when it's a lot of snow. So this hotspot has leading to back roads that I like to take um, where it mainly has like one stop sign but no real slow down um, signs for it because coming around that curve, you're not prepared for that stop sign that's like five feet away. You're just coming swinging around and not paying attention to cars coming out of parking lots. Um, and then also a recommendation could be at that beginning of the curve, put a slow down sign. Since the stoplight is right there, slow down sign right here next or in front of Joanne's what really helps slow down cars because I have that guilty moment of like coming around that curve and not paying attention and not noticing like, oh, there's a stop sign right there. Um, I have witnessed personally during the winter time because crashes happen a lot right there. There's a house right next to Joanne's that has a wall up. And I don't know if anybody noticed about it, if you ever take that road, but the wall got crashed into by a car. And so now it's a lower wall. So helping cars to pay attention that, hey, during the winter time, you might want to slow down. You're not like 
hyperplane and off of the road, it will definitely help to slow down cars and slow down traffic, um, especially when like you're coming out of Joanne's or the top spot restaurant right next door. If you put those slow down signs right there and be cautious, look left and right, there's cars flying, they're coming. And to know that like, hey, because it's such a small little intersection is such a small little street. Our VIPs actually park across the street next to Smith's instead of closer because we want them to be safe. But also it's really hard to like watch over and monitor because it's such a small little road and it's only like a one way road both ways. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this intersection is 1925 North and Main. Um, this specifically has the high school, middle school, and a few food places nearby. And the coming and going from school in the morning and afternoon causes more specific, um, causes those specific times to get very busy with plenty of traffic. So that the busyness and the pop population in that area during those times can be concerning. Um, signage is probably the most likely solution, um, but all, but the t times of the crashes that happened were 12.02 and 2.36 p.m. So another suggestion would be instead of having the volunteers and police there from 3 to 5, to have this specific area be monitored at different times, like during those lunch period hours of the school or after school or before school. So only two crashes were recorded during intervention times in this four month period. And one was observed by police and one was observed by volunteers, suggesting that both police and volunteers have an equal amount of crash deterrence by simply being there. The log file finding shows that the majority of the time while our police and volunteers were in these areas, <coughs> crashes did not happen and speeds were lower. And some of these hotspots like the high school need different times in order for this uh, intervention to be truly effective because of just different high flow traffic times. Yeah, so this study shows us that volunteers and police services are a very valuable tool in these police departments. Intervention times may need to be changed in certain hotspots and that if this project and continues to receive this kind of support, we can further reduce our crashes in this community. And I would like to thank the chief and Cedar City Police again for their support of us in this project. Uh, if you have any questions, yeah, we'd like to answer. Yeah, Dr. Questions. Park, I have a question, uh, and it may be you or perhaps it's Chief Adams, I'm not sure, yes. but um, how does this um, reduction or the data you have, how does it compare to when we don't have preventative people there? Yeah, uh, actually we are actually uh, analyzing the before the intervention and after the okay. intervention. And since our project just ended uh, right. this, I mean, uh, last week, so we are actually collecting and we can show more better uh, data findings in July. Okay. And I would just say to you, if you would like to get a photograph of all of them, just come around here and take a photograph of all of yes, them. Thank you. Don't be afraid to do that. Tom, are you a photographer? Use their, use their camera. Oh, you brought one. You've got one. The young. Okay. You city council. It'll take too long. Just can you blank it? There's a button that lets you turn the screen off momentarily. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for coming this evening. And now, Mr. Johnson. Mayor and Council, so we had 47G, which is the Utah Association for Aerospace and Defense. They were going to come present, but they had a last-minute conflict, so they're, oh. they're, we're going to reschedule with them to come down. But just to give you a high-level highlight, um, a as the uh, agenda describes, they're the Utah Association for Aerospace and Defense. So Boeing, Northrop Grumman, uh, uh, several of these, of these large companies 
our members of this, um, as well as some of our sister cities and counties around the state. Um, we, we are recently members of, the, of uh, 47G as well. Um, they have me sit on the Board of the Governors, uh, Board of Governors for the organization, and the intent is with a lot of the industrial um, that we have here with the Inland Park and with our aviation programs here at our university, we've got a lot to leverage here uh, for this association and hope that uh, we can get some hopefully big players in the future to, to come here. Um, with our helicopter school, a lot of people don't know this, but um, w w um, one in there, one in every 10 helicopter pilots in the United States is trained here at Southern Utah University's aviation program. And so um, those are the types of things that we're trying to help communicate out there to the aerospace and defense community. And so hopefully I'll get them here in the next month or so and they can present to you and give you a bit more of a robust presentation on what they do. So thanks. Thank you. Um, any other things from the staff? I think that does it. Uh, this is a work meeting tonight, so if you have a comment you want to make on any of the agenda items, even though it doesn't say a public meeting, you're welcome to make a comment during the, during the, when we call it up on the public agenda starting there. But in the meantime, you have an opportunity for public comment on anything else in the that you would like to say, and Mr. Christian is getting all ready to go and warm up. I am, as you know. <laughs> um, my girlfriend's here from St. George, I'm so State happy. your name, Christian. Oh, Christian Lee Simmons. Um, my girlfriend's here from St. George. I'm so grateful. Um, she might move up here with me. Um, but um, the traffic stop that, uh, well, they're not here, I guess. I can't talk about them now. Great. Yeah, the traffic stop. We need to. We need to um, make people slow down. You know, because they go too fast. They go way too fast on the roads. Um, Do you know which traffic stop we're talking about, Christian? Which yes, one? I know. Which I know one? what we're talking about. Which one is it? The one that they were talking about. Well, they talked about six of them. Yeah, I know, six of them. I'm talking about the six of them. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think we should, um, as a community, you know, if you see something, say something. You know, if somebody's driving so fast, maybe pull over and tell them to slow down. You know, that's, 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 my new, that's the new goal that I'm trying to make the city to make the city to not worry about crashes or car accidents or people going to hospitals, you know, because, you know, a lot, <laughs> this town's getting big, you know, it's getting like St. George, it's getting big. And then we need to wake up and smell the coffee before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Clark, I know you're busy, so I just want to say thank you. I've been gone for a month. And it was so great to come back and see. Be gone. <laughs> it was great to be back. <laughs> no, it was good to be gone, but I was doing a lot of intense work. Anyway, um, it was good to come back and to Cedar City. I was really grateful. All of the, you know, people were having, you know, trimming and cleaning up. And, and I saw this trucks come on my street today picking everything up. And I realized it's such a gift, and I wanted to thank the city for that. My husband said today that he was out by the War Memorial, and they were cleaning that up. And I know you'll clean up the the um, cemetery for Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. My only concern right now is the aquatic center and the ball field because um, uh, the ball field looks dead and it looks like it needs to be um, fertilized. And I know we're with the expansion of the summer games, it's really important that those things are taken care of. I, I usually weed the aquatic center. I didn't last year to see what would happen. And nothing has been cleaned up there. So my question is, is, are, is there a scheduled time to come in and clean up the dead brush, the weeds that died from last year, and now a lot of weeds are growing. Um, so my concern is that because, you know, it, I, I will just say this. I, my, my grandson 
plays roller hockey down in North Hollywood. And I went down there and I saw what happens to a place that doesn't take care of things. It, was a, it had looked like it had been a beautiful park and it was full of homeless people, it was trash, it was just overgrown grass and weeds. And I thought it was so sad because it really had been a beautiful park. And so I really, I guess I came back to say thank you be, for being so concerned that we clean up and then you know, questioning about the, just the ball field in the aquatic center because I realize how important it is. Thank you. They have fertilized the ball fields. Any other public comments? Okay, let's uh, start through the agenda. Item number one, consider local consent alcohol permit for DC pub and grill at 650 South Main Street. You're actually here? Oh, okay. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I've never been to one stand of these. Stand there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stand here. <laughs> See if they ask you any questions. Well, just tell us a little bit about the business. What are you trying to do? So we're just a small family-owned business. Um, we're just looking to bring something a little different into Cedar City. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time down here, so it's something that we kind of fell in love with the idea, and we've just kind of been pursuing it. We've been kind of watching the area for like the last year, and it finally came available, and now we're just kind of trying to pursue it, get some set up and put in there. And so you, you're small. currently the ones that are doing the remodeling and the work uh, the that's going on? The owner is actually doing the remodeling right I now see. from the fire. Um, and putting everything, and we met with him already, and putting things away. Some of the things that we want to do in there, he's trying to help us with, and like about construction people in there. You gonna keep the cow? The cow's gonna stay. It might not be on the roof, but it'll be there. You gotta have the cow. <laughs> now, you guys own the the DC Pub and Grill up in Duck Creek as well, correct? Correct. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. And so, is this liquor license just for the alcohol, just for beer, like for the kind of the gas station concession part? It's a full liquor license. Just like Applebee's or Chili's, so it's full. Oh, okay, so it's a full liquor license, not just for beer sales. Okay. Yeah. Chief? Chief? No, you're fine. Uh, Chief Adams with the police department, we've done the background. There are no issues. We give it a positive recommendation. Okay. okay. Let's put it on consent. Consent. Thank you. That, that it? That means you probably <laughs> are done. Okay. Thank we you. We actually yeah. vote on it next week. We vote on it next week, but if it gets on the consent agenda, Tradition around here is that it's done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item number two, consider a resolution replacing a trustee for the Chelsea Public Infrastructure District. Dallas Buckner goes civil. Um, also a trustee on the Chelsea PID board. Um, Looking to get off. <coughs> they suggested it, and I was more than happy to oblige. <laughs> so... Um, I've been on the board. Um, we're obviously moving forward with construction and getting everything buttoned up with engineering, but uh, the developers and other board members felt that it was appropriate to put someone else on the development team in there, and I've got enough meetings to attend, and so I wrote up a resignation letter, and this is one of the steps that the council approve it. So. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about the replacement? Don't know. Tell you more next week. I know she was on our last board meeting Zoom call, but I didn't get a background of. <coughs> okay, that's all I have. Hmm. I don't think there's really for these a much of a vetting process, so uh, consent. No. Just it's, a a resolution. it's a resolution. Oh, it's a resolution. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Item number three: UDOT Main Street Plan and Historic Downtown Improvements. All right, Mayor and Council. <coughs> Um, hopefully this should be easy to explain. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so first let me give a little context. So UDOT um, hired Avenue consultants to do a Main Street study from the north end of town to the south end of town. They're going to come at a later date to talk about that broader study. Um, tonight what I'm coming to you about is simply the historic downtown portion. Um, and the reason why is um, my department has hired a consultant to put together um, a, a long-range plan for the landscaping, for the walkability, um, for signage, those sorts of things. And so, but before they can move forward with that plan, um, they have to get some, UDOT, at, w they, Blue Line Design is that consultant, and Avenue, consul uh, Avenue Consultants and UDOT need feedback from the city on what they want the curb 
to look like in downtown. Um, and pretty much from Avenue Consultants Main Street plan, there's really only two options. And I'm, 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 it, and it, I'm not really even oversimplifying it. Essentially, it's keep the existing curb um, or expand the existing curb. Um, please keep in mind that both these options could be five years out or 20 years out. Um, we're not talking tomorrow that this is going to happen because of the infrastructure impacts that it has. With that said, in both options, um, the expanded cur or keeping the existing curb, what they will do is they will put in a bike lane, which will remove the on-street parking on Main Street. And that's, it's a UDOT street. That's their prerogative to do such. Um, with the extended curb, it's going to be the same story. The bike lane will still go in the same spot, but instead of being on the road, it's going to go up on the sidewalk. So really extending the curb isn't going to give us more sidewalk, so to speak, at least for businesses, putting tables out. And quite frankly, uh, aesthetically, it would be great if the bike lanes weren't there and that sidewalk would be used for businesses, tables, signs, yada, yada, that kind of stuff. That would be great. But really the intent is for the bike lanes. Um, and so the cost of that goes up exponentially when you're talking about moving curb and gutter. Um, and so w I've taken this to the historic downtown committee. And the historic downtown committee really, even before I got here, was the impetus of let's redo our trees and the grates and then it grew into let's put together a plan for the historic downtown. But before really they can move forward, we need some feedback in. The recommendation from the historic downtown committee as well as um, uh, engineering and myself um, met with UDOT um, and really what I feel like is the obvious answer is keep the existing curb because you're getting the, about the same amount of space. Um, the same elements are being put in a bike lane, middle, median, um, they're trying to slow down traffic. Um, some proposed um, bumps in the intersection to slow down traffic. Some of those things remain the same. But really the question here is, and looking for a motion um, to show support to UDOT what the city's preferred route is. Now with that said, even though the historic downtown committee and staff would say that it's most cost effective to keep the existing curb, if the council says, you know what, we really like the idea of extending the curb, doing the curb and gutter. Mm -hmm. Just keep in mind two important elements. As one, you're probably looking at a longer timeline to implement something like that. And two, um, UDOT would likely come to the city, um, and this is what they've expressed to us, to help you know cover some of those costs of extending the curb and gutter. So with that said, I'll kind of leave it for any questions and, and discussion you may have. I, I definitely have a couple of questions. One. Have you taken this to our active transportation committee to see which one of the two they prefer? I ha I haven't, no. Okay, because I, I mean, I know in here it says I know which one bicyclists prefer. They prefer to be on the curb, but I would love to hear what our active transportation committee says about this. As That's this good is. Which, which bicyclists? Yeah. I'm just, according to what this says, I, it says I, they I prefer just, it to be on I the curb. I know what you're getting at. I highly yeah, question that. Yeah. yeah. So the, sa the safest I think you've got. Yeah, actually, we're going to. Th this is Chris Hall with you, Don. He can probably speak to it. And then I have another question. So, the Active Transportation Committee was uh, a stakeholder in the study. They had a, a chance to provide comments. I don't remember any specific comments that they provided one way or another. I think they were more focused on we want infrastructure to accommodate that. And I don't know that they had specific comments about which one they prefer. All they wanted was to make sure there was a buffered protection between the moving traffic and the bike lane. Mm -hmm. And either one would do that because, as I understand, Chris, is there still would be a buffered uh, curb, curb yeah, for the bike lane. So that's my next question, and this maybe is a question for our streets department. How, I mean, what is that, how does that affect plowing? And if we do with the buffer in the, what I worry about with the little buffer, <laughs> what do you do with the six feet when there's snow on the ground? You can't plow a six foot wide strip of asphalt. You, you can't, plow you can. Street. Huh? Yeah. We don't plow Main Street. Okay, so my question then would be to you, Dot. How do you plow the six-foot wide bike lane when it's on the asphalt? There's a good chance with that curb separating them, we would not be able to because it's six-foot wide. So it essentially would make that unusable when there's snow on the ground. And my concern is there, when you plow Main Street, it's just going to, all that snow is going to go and fill up that six-foot wide buffered. There will be a few days here where you can't use yeah. that. And I, if yeah. 
if, if there's one thing I've learned, it's the minute you start talking about snow plows, you can't ever have nice things if, if, if snow plows are a consideration. So we just have to realize that that will not be usable a few days well, a year. Well, I don't, I'm, I certainly don't want to throw our parks and rec people under the bus, but no, we, but have a, we, we have a six right foot plow right now that plows our trails mm -hmm. yeah. when it snows. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but of course that's more workload for them. Mm -hmm. So, but I do agree with Councilman Melling. I don't want that to be the thing that says we're not going to beautify our downtown because of the eight days a year that we might not be able to use it because of the snow. And I, I have a, I have a real question because, I mean, I haven't been doing it as much in the last few years, but as a cyclist, you avoid Main Street like the plague. Yep. I'm sorry, you do. You don't go to on Main Street. It's the worst place there is to ride, mm -hmm. next to Highway 56. Unless you've got Cyclists a good. Cyclists don't. If you have a good life insurance policy, it's not True. so bad. True. True. Uh, <coughs> I one sure one question paid. I I would have, and this would be long term. What options do we have in putting bollards up? Uh, you know, if if we have a separating curb, so it's it's still at the street level, the the bike lane. But over time, if, if we wanted to install bollards um, between the bike lane and the traffic, would that be an option? I believe it would. I can't say yes or no, but I would, something we'd have to analyze as, as UDOT to say what are the safety impacts for some of the vehicles if they crashed into them. But I think it's, it's something that we would be open to looking at to consider. So are you talking about the plastic ones that will actually bend, or are you talking I'm, about I'm talking about concrete steel reinforced ones over time that – because that's only a 35 mile hour speed limit, so it's not going to be a fatal crash. But if someone <laughs> should be 25, it or I yeah, it's 30 in the downtown. It, area. Is, 30, it is 30, but it should be 25. Right, and so it's it's pretty low speed, low risk of serious injury to a car, but to a cyclist or pedestrian, and and to make them feel safer as as they're uh, uh, traversing our main street. Right now, it's it doesn't feel safe for pedestrians either. And so, and, and while a, a lane and a curb helps, I do think long term we, we want to look at some kind of bollard or other separation. Yeah, the bump outs will help with that too. I and, think. And, and I believe it will. Um, but, you know, there, there are other safety concerns there with some of the worldwide events that have happened to sure. in separating pedestrian areas from uh, vehicle areas with bollards. And um, just it, as long as it was specced out that way so that that could be implemented over time. Um, whether through our RDA funding or, or anything else, um, I, I would like to keep that option on the table. Is there an option not to have a bike trail on Main Street? And the reason I say that is because I've been in other cities where they have them, and most of them are on what we would call 100 East or 100 West, and they go on the back sides so they can still get on those spurs and it's not as dangerous. I've, I've seen just many of them off that main drag. That, that's absolutely an option. As UDOT, we're trying to promote all users, but we understand that we want to make sure that the community has a say in this and it meets their vision. Um, and so, yes, if the community says we're going to say let's direct bikes to another one and provide adequate infrastructure there, th then, then yes, it's absolutely plausible to say that. <coughs> when we did our community survey here, we did get a lot of comments that this is what was wanted from the community. But once again, um, we're open to whatever option you guys prefer. If, yeah, if it's not I do, something the wants because of safety concerns or other issues, th then it's absolutely fe feasible to say we can, the city can identify a, a local street to put that on. Yeah, because I, the state route. I agree. I think I think focusing on pedestrians in this area, but even you know we're working on an east northwest corridor right now. We just have a few little things to work out uh, to to traverse the entirety of the city on the east side of Main Street. And I, I think that would be more conducive to cyclists than um, than yes. ma our main street. Correct, and then and, there's and more used. into main street if you want to get down yes. there. Right. So I think what the I think what the study was <coughs> trying to do was just to make sure there was more connectivity mm -hmm. and there was more walkability and uh, pedestrian friendly and you know whatever that means. We're trying to calm and slow down the traffic. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that a bike lane necessarily does that, but it's probably better than not having it just to slow down traffic. So I don't think that we have to necessarily look at this because Blue Line is just going to be starting this process now to design something. But I think uh, our, our whole idea is 
how can we slow down traffic and make it more connectivity there? Mm -hmm. Whether that means not having them or having them, but whatever, that's the goal. Right, and and if, if there weren't bike lanes here, I, I, I don't think we would want parking there or anything. I mean, it, wherever that bike lane it would would uh, cross into traffic would still need to be protected p pedestrian area and I think a lot of the businesses down there would like that too yeah. I guess I'll, but, but that's option this is what we did came up with as part of sure. our study and that's what kind of what we heard back from the community but if, if you want to and this isn't set in stone so if there's something that council wants to change or the community says we, we don't like this it's absolutely something we can readdress but I think for the, for the purpose of this motion is kind of deciding so they can finish the yeah. study so they can kind of carry it if you know, the community kind of has to make way for whatever reason for it. Yeah. Well, I think 100 West is certainly wide enough to paint a bike lane down it, um, at least on a portion of it. I, I, I think we could move it off the main street and have it be well, safer. Well, eventually even 100 East, right, where right. eventually it'll go through from. Yeah, I, I would rather have it on 100 East because of the, because the, um, commercial traffic is is less there it is yeah no, and either one I think is better than the Main Street option yeah and I, I think for the purposes of tonight and what Chris was getting at is so later when UDOT presents the whole plan you can dive into some of those yeah. specific requests mm -hmm. but for tonight's purpose we just need to know if you have strong sentiment one way or the other what would the council like to do as far as the existing curb or expanding the curb um, or do you leave it as is I, th I think for bikes we would leave it as is exactly. I think I think if if it was more pedestrian focused over time um, we're talking probably 10 to 20 year range exactly right then then we would probably want to bring the curb uh, and the sidewalk closer to that area uh, especially if the bikes had an alternative path one block over what's the What's the, how far out is this plan? I couldn't. I well, right now they have no money at all. <coughs> no, I mean the, the long-term planning for this. Is this oh. like you're envisioning in the next 20 years or? It, it depends on how fast the traffic Kay. goes. Um, so it's really, who knows? It's hard to predict <laughs> when it will come. Um, but, but yeah, I think there's. I, Sorry, I just, 20, I just so. wanted that to be heard from you, Dot, so you had, and the public had perspective mm -hmm. on, on that. Right. Right. I would just say, before we move completely away from this, I would just say that there was a lot of discussion, there was a lot of public meetings that happened over the course of the study, yeah. and the Acting Transportation Committee was very active in this, and they really pushed for bike lanes downtown. So before we just walk away from it, let's just make sure we get a complete vision of it before we completely... Can decide I, to walk away from it. Can I ask just one more question? And it has to do with this, but is there a way in this, for example, I know this option isn't presented, but is there a way to just create a wider bike path on one side of Main Street and have it be both direction bike lane? Is that something you ever see anywhere, or do you have to have one on each side of the street? So, no, it, it is it's done in other places. It's called the cycle track, and, yes, it's just a, a wider bike lane that has multi-directions. And it depends on the use, it functions really well. Um, if you're trying to get people through there, if there's a lot of destinations on, on both sides, having them on one side, it creates this. Yeah, because you got, then they got across the street. It, but it could still function very well, so that's, that is definitely a possibility. Okay. Well, for me at least, I mean, the question we're being asked is which of these two, I prefer just to leave the curb the way it is. And I agree. I, I, I think agree. there's other discussions we obviously want to have on whether. Main Street's the right one. I would like to discuss what it would look like if we just had on one side of Main Street, but out of well, these see, two options, all, That should all come throughout with the blue line discussion when they start designing that section. But of, but of these two options, I say just leave the curve the way it is. Mm -hmm. I do, too. I think so that's going to be Can that consensus. go on consent? Is that an that item we need option? to vote on next week? Paul? Pardon? Can that go on consent as... Or do we even need to do anything with it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think there's anything to vote on. Yeah. Okay. It would be not, I mean, I, I was thinking it would be nice to have an official motion just so UDOT knows this is the stance of okay. the city. Okay. Well, that won't happen until next week. <laughs> you have your correction? <laughs> I, I don't know that we say we have to because the, the blue line portion is a different contract, so I don't know that UDOT wants to step in and say one way or another, so I would prefer to okay. say that. Let's put it on consent then next yeah. week as an abundance of caution to leave, leave the curb is. as is. Leave it as is on consent. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So we're only talking curb. Yeah. Only talking curb. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back with the with the blue line design and the recommendations through that, which also already went through a public process. It's just this curb question has held up their portion. So. Okay. Okay. Item number four. <coughs> okay. Well, May you're still up. Yeah. Farmers market and event policies on closing city streets. Okay. Johnson. Uh, Mayor and council, this is hopefully pretty simple. So we've had a farmer's market on 100 West uh, for the last uh, two years now, four, or years. four years total, but la Wednesday nights were. Well, it's been, it's been Why don't you okay, come up to you. the yeah. microphone? Yeah, so. Heather Carter, um, we've, ha we've been on um, the north side of Center Street on 100 West for a year and we've been, um, we were on the south side of Center Street for about a year before that. Correct. So um, essentially what we found is uh, typically when we have an event, whether it's a single day event, multi-day event, multi-month event, um, there's an application process um, that we've had as well as if they're renting a park, there's a fee associated or a pavilion or heritage theater, whatever it is. Um, currently we don't have a policy in place for um, closing a street, utilizing a street for events. Um, a lot of events that we have that have been on street closures are usually on, on a UDOT road that we work with them on. But having a third party come in has been the question. And this year what we asked them to do, and Heather's been wonderful in, in helping us to kind of formalize a little bit more. Is she went in and filled out the events application just so we can have documentation of the plan and you know where vendors are set up restrooms etc um, and she's been very helpful in, in going through that process so the question was well what do we do because um, right now it's Wednesdays and Saturdays um, Heather actually worked with engineering uh, last year about this time to get signs up regarding parking um, during the farmers market times and so we took this to the downtown committee um, down, historic downtown economic committee because there were concerns about businesses and the impacts, concerns about parking, etc. And um, and Heather was good to meet with some of these businesses, listen to some of the concerns. Um, the long story short is the question still remained because I think what Scott had conveyed to staff is that um, they approved the Wednesdays last year and wanted to kind of come back and analyze how things were going and she came and did a great presentation to the historic downtown committee on the success that that we've seen there and then we've also met with other businesses to hear some of the concerns and forgive me for a little bit of the, the long background but I want you to kind of understand the context so really what the historic downtown committee made recommendation of um, is that we continue to approve and we've already pre-approved her event application but wanted to hold off on the formal approval so to speak to the council could um, you know weigh in if, if you felt inclined to do so but the historic downtown committee and staff recommends that we continue to let the farmers market over this next year um, uh, function as it has been um, they've been very uh, workable and have provided us with the information needed and in the meantime what um, event staff is doing is putting together an informal events policy that dictates and kind of guides uh, guides is probably the better word um, what do we do when we want to have a street closure for a farmer's market or a block party or so some, some I'm going to cut you off right there because our ordinance already deals with that. The ordinance already delegates that authority to my office to close streets. And traditionally it's been used for block parties and other things of that nature. I wouldn't close it for the farmer's market because it's every Saturday and every Wednesday. And that's where the council stepped in and said, okay, let's give it a try. So that's already an ordinance. You don't need to reinvent a policy to create something that already exists. So that's actually not what I was getting at, though. What I was getting at was the question of uh, fees associated. So some of the question that's come up with the historic downtown committee um, and some of the businesses are, well, the local businesses there, or the brick-and-mortar businesses, they pay, um, they pay into the parking authority and some of those things. And so the question was, well, they're using um, city infrastructure or city uh, facilities, so to speak. And so how does that all play out? And so what we wanted to do was um, 
take uh, create an events policy that's beyond just um, the farmers market that would take into consideration some of the existing policies and ordinances that exist and put them in something that's simple so if we have another farmers market request elsewhere or block party requests or whatever they are that it's all just in one easy reference policy that then also describes to them how to walk through um, uh, the events application process as well so it's not necessarily in reinventing the wheel or usurping what well, that's already in what place. the presentation sounded like when you said you wanted to create an events policy so events can determine when and where we close public streets for public uh, things well I'm so, I forgive me that's not the intent the intent is how do we address some of these questions that were in place <coughs> around that exist around the existing ordinance and stuff and forgive me I, I, I did I was aware that that's how it was approved previously as it came to your office to approve the farmers market and I forgot to add that in there but the, the real question is Mayor and Council, do you want to continue to allow the farmer's market this year to continue in the way that it has been functioning? Um, the recommendation from the Historic Downtown Committee is that yes, let them continue to function this year. And then while we work on a more, f a more formal policy that's, that's broader than just the farmer's market of, of you know, events that come in. And so uh, an events policy would also capture and dictate um, a little bit on well, what happens when the city's approach to sponsor give funding? What happens when the city's approach to um, be a partner in an event? What happens when it's a city sponsored event? What happens when it's a third party event? Because our office gets that question a lot, and I've had this experience um, in Did other places. through this like three weeks ago with you and Brandon and me and Jason and and Kenny, and we resolved that. Is there still a question on how we're going to handle that? Um, no part of that discussion was helping to create. They've dealt with sponsorships and partnerships and everything else. I mean, we did talk about that. So um, what I was, sorry, I'm being, t I'm taken off guard a little bit. And I Why? thought in the discussion about that, that and that's what we had discussed in that meeting, is that um, Brandon, as the events director, was working on putting together kind of a guideline uh, from the city that would help the public better understand how some of these processes work. So, again, I'm not talking about reinventing the wheel. I'm talking about taking what we have been doing because the events director position has turned over a few times over the last few years. Um, and some of the responsibility of that process has flip-flopped. And so kind of the discussion was situations like the farmer's market, situations like um, uh, uh, a couple of the things that have been approached, and I'm sorry, Brandon uh, Burke's at a conference right now, so he can't help respond. But there's been a few situations that it wasn't clear in one place on how do we handle or manage a specific type of event or event situation so again I'm not saying that the intent is to reinvent the wheel I'm just saying we're putting together some of the information of existing policy and then helping identify if there's gaps in that policy to make it clear for the public on what those processes I guess are for me mr. Johnson is um, on the and uh, I've spoken to Heather quite extensively about this is uh, and uh, Councilman Riddle and Councilman Melling should remember that when we approved this a year ago for the Wednesday market, it was on a trial basis for a year. Sure. See yeah. how it went, to see what the impact was, because it was in the evening time. It was, again, in the middle of the week and work weeks. And, and as you say, as your presentation, we had some ups and downs with some businesses, but we've tried to work through those, and I think we've made some good headway on that. Right. <coughs> for So I guess um, we're just trying to get some idea is if this is something we want to do and I know the historic downtown committee recommended that they allow it for another year and see how it progresses and then make a determination for sure what we're going to do for me personally and I don't know how the rest of the council feels I I just question the idea of a fee it seems to me there should be some a fee associated with this as it is a for-profit entity that is out there helping 
small businesses and local farmers, and I understand all that. Uh, I just think that they should be some kind of a fee set up, and I don't know what that fee is, but what you're saying is right now we don't have a mechanism for that. Exactly. So you're trying to figure what that mechanism is. That, is that my understanding? That yeah, correctly? exactly. So, okay. th yeah, there's, there's nothing in policy that kind of <coughs> dictates that. And so right now what we're saying is while that's still a discussion, um, and I, I wasn't trying to indicate that there's no – there's nothing guiding, but there's there's some things, there's a few gaps like this, like is there a fee associated with closing, with road closures, things like that for events, that while we're trying to figure that out, looking at current ordinance and seeing maybe what uh, things we need to bring to the committee. So to change the council. conversation, if it were a nonprofit that, that organized this. Yeah, you don't want to, I mean, if you have a block party on your street and you're closing down the street for a night, Traditionally, we haven't charged the no. block party right. the fee right. to close down the street. I think street. it probably would. I mean, I, 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 you're the CPA, yeah. but I think it would change. Right, right. And I, I, I'm I just wondering in, in just ordinance or the understanding of it, if, if that's it, that's a simple yeah. well, and change. I think, too, the, I don't like fees either, but as, especially anywhere downtown where every business there has to pay fees annually per employee and based on the type of business and per customer and all that because of the downtown parking authority right then if if someone's using that parking then yeah I, I, I would see where a fee would come in to, to level the playing field for everybody but sure again, we you know we need to be transparent and have that predictable and everything else so so I would be in favor of just letting things continue for a year as they have been keep gathering data and then yeah let's work on getting everything worked out for next year right and and that's really all I'm getting at is there there's clearly a bigger discussion to be had um, and um, some other th little gaps and stuff that you know events has identified that they've gotten questions and felt like we don't have a clear answer on so there's that and a few things that we just want to bring a little clarity right. to so I'm not talking about reinventing the wheel I'm just trying to m make it more clear but in the interim the what's really on the table is mayor council do you guys want to continue to let them work as is and uh, while we work on being able to address those bigger and questions because I felt like she was being held up because we have these bigger questions yeah Does and to Mrs. Sense? Carter's credit she has agreed and she understands and and has agreed that if she be willing to pay some kind of a fee. Obviously, we haven't established what that is, so we don't, you know, we don't know what that is. But I want to know that she is not opposed to that idea. I don't want to be speaking for you, but we have had that conversation. So I have a question too. Um, have you have you gotten mostly favorable feedback from the business owners that it actually helps their business, or is it is it uh, is it negatively impacting them? What what's the I would say my there. staff, I mean, we definitely have several businesses who spoke very favorably. Um, and then there's a few businesses who feel like it's, it's a hindrance in the sense that people come in and use their bathrooms or people are taking up their parking. Um, and Heather has, tr you know, sat down with them and tried to address that. Like, if you go look, um, I think it was two Saturdays ago, I was driving by or walking by and, and saw lots of signage saying parking this way. Um, she's worked with Bristle Cone and the Johnson Center, is that right, to, for restrooms. Um, so that's part of what we're doing, and that's why we wanted her to fill out the event application, the current existing event application, because then it'll tell us, okay, well, how many people are you having? And then next year when she fills out the application again, if, say, numbers have doubled, then we can say, oh, well, Bristle Cone and Johnson Center is great, but you, we may need to work on getting a couple porta-potties out on that area. And so... It, it's just having good conversation. So, yes, I would definitely say there's a couple businesses that feel very passionate that, you know, they don't, um, that the farmer's market isn't helping them because it's just using their bathrooms and their parking. But I would say that there's a large majority of, of um, businesses that like it and feel that it creates synergy. And the truth is, setting that aside, one, one of the things in a historic downtown, and I've already seen since I've been here, a lot of the discussion about, um, historic downtown is what events could we do to help create more foot traffic down here if that makes sense and so you know it the it's still growing Wednesday this was just this last year and it was only for like half the year right. from what I understand and so that's why the historic downtown committee said let's give it another year to try um, see how that works and we can evaluate accordingly so I, so I have a question Mr. Bittman do we have any 
businesses down there that have called in and said, hey, this is not working for me. Or, um, or they haven't called your office. My office has. Okay. Yeah. You had them come into the city council a year ago. Yes, we when did. When we first started the Wednesday night thing. Uh, two weeks in a row they came in. I think it was the pub kitchen and, and a couple more on that block. And their biggest issues were parking and bathrooms. And Heather worked to uh, do something else, try something different. And I haven't heard from them since then. Okay. But you guys have heard that feedback as well. I have a couple of comments on this, if I may. And I'm going to have some questions for Heather. So if she wants to step up to the sure. microphone also. and. Um, you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot and Heather and I met or Mrs. Carter and I met and Councilman Phillips was there. We met for about an hour here, uh, last week, week before last. And, you know, through my personal relationships, as you know, I deal a lot with farmers markets and other farms here in town. And, and I want the public to know that farmers markets are a very important thing. And our few, our food security and the future of where our food comes from is a very important thing. Now, I've had the discussion with Mrs. Carter. There's, you know, there's different definitions of what is a farmer's market. Some people would say what she has isn't a farmer's market. Some people, and by definitions, would say she is a farmer's market, right? I mean, yes. correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, anytime you start bringing in vendors that sell anything other than raw food, by some definitions, you're no longer a farmer's market. You're a vendor fair that happens to have some farmers as well. So what I want to get out for the public, though, and why I had you come up and the questions I have, because I, I actually get calls on this quite frequently. I, I know some business owners in that area. Some love it, some don't. The idea behind a traditional farmer's market, my understanding, is when you have a place that brings people in for the raw produce and nothing else, then what happens is when they're there buying that, then they go to the local coffee shop, they go to the local restaurant, they do these other things. Where in a situation like hers, all those things, not all those things, but some of those things come to the market so people come, but then they never have to leave the market. So the other businesses don't always benefit from the traditional foot traffic. I do think some do benefit from the additional foot traffic. But my main questions that I'd like to hear publicly, could you just walk us through, so you have the permit with the city to have the event, which I think is the correct way. What do the vendors do? And I, I know you and I have had this discussion, but I want some of the public that are hearing and that are here to kind of know how it works. So all the vendors, they have a city business license, is that correct? Yes. Okay, they're not, I know some, every city does it different. Some you have to go and every week the vendor has to pay the city a fee or an event fee and all that, but how do we do it in our situation? So, yeah, so they, they each have a license and that's something that we worked out quite a few years ago and I think at the time it was Randall maybe and Renan that we all yes. kind of worked to add that out. That because we are a year round farmer's market okay. um, and not, a special event that's happening at a, for a short period of time um, then we worked out that we they would purchase a city license and also um, with the state tax commission we have also worked that out where it's either a six month or a year lo long process instead of them getting a separate se um, like state event. sales tax permit okay, each yeah, week. You would know kind of this. Yes. So they're, they're not getting that slip at the end of each thing that you're just saying to them, your problem is with the, you do. What you well, do the it state was tax that commission. actually until a couple of weeks ago when I talked to the, um, to the state tax commission again, um, they want to reevaluate that because they did have some new staff on at the time where they told us to just have your people file on their own. So they are actually in the process of reevaluating and we're probably just going to issue each person that as they um, sign up for the market, they will get it for the entire year and it will be due at the end of the tax season. Okay. It will just follow the normal sales tax procedure yes. where if they have certain liability they file monthly or quarterly or whatever. Same right. as if they had a brick and mortar location. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, I mean, per our conversation, so this isn't going to come as a, as a surprise, I, I feel like uh, Councilman Phillips and that I do think we should continue to support this. I personally do. I, but I do think, I mean, I've had other businesses say, well, how do I get to close down a street and how do I get to use it and not have to pay a fee? So I think there, and you know that, there is that question. And so, and as I'm even sitting here thinking, well, do we include her as one of the businesses like the downtown parking authority? Is there a way to charge some that way to, you know, I don't know how we charge businesses that involved in the downtown parking authority, but I'm sure there's a way to figure it out that there way. Is. There's a formula. So is it, do we maybe charge something that way because they're using those parking spaces or do we 
charge based off of the square foot? I don't know, but we do need to figure that out. And I want to make sure also, for me at least, if we do agree to this, we're moving forward, I don't want to say that those changes can't come in this next year. Like, let's go ahead and start, but I don't want to have to wait till next year to implement. If we come up with something in the next two to three months or whatever it might be of, hey, here's what we think we should charge, that we could start doing it this year and not have to wait till next year. I don't know how other councilmen feel about that, but that's well, just my only other thought. My only hesitation with that is that if the fees um, exceed the amount that we are able to pay as a farmer's market based on our vendor fees, because you know we aren't bringing in tons of revenue um, we're br you know we're bringing in enough to like cover things and and to you know project some of the expenses for the next year um, but if those fees are beyond our ability to pay then you know we would need some time to, yeah, to consider we don't want to kill you mid-season I yeah. get that especially busy season which is right around the corner we've already seen a huge increase of of um, customers the last few weeks so so th that's my only hesitation is that we would you know need some time to decide if those fees are gonna work for us considering that we have absolutely no idea what price range we're looking at right now but yeah you know, I, I think the traditional formula because it, it doesn't matter how often your business is open it the traditional formula th those fees likely would be in the ballpark of two to three grand and that's not insignificant and right so I, I per year and so I, I don't want to implement that mid-season I would say let's let's just do it and then have staff work to give you plenty of notice going into next season um, how you need to adjust your model okay. and I, I do also want to um, you know bring up the fact that we are really working hard to direct our customers into the Johnson Center parking lot which is um, which they have given us use for for our customers um, our biggest hang-up is is signage and so I, I, I don't know if that's um, you know uh, Randall or Paul I don't know which who, I, I don't know if um, signage is who it falls under but really to for us to be able to avoid less parking problems and direct people to our parking lot which is the Johnson Center we need s to somehow figure out how we can direct them there with signs and so we've been trying to be really careful and not post signs where we're not supposed to. But aren't you, as you post your signs, I mean, I see them up and down 300 West on Center Street and 200 North. We're trying uh, to can't put that actually be a sign that directs to <coughs> where you're parking. Well, that was a, that was kind of a problem last year. Uh, UDOT doesn't want them on their right of way. Okay. So we've been trying uh, to put them on private to property. Put them on private property to keep them off the city right of way, off UDOT right of way. Okay. Um, we're talking yeah. about the A-frames, right? The yes. temporary A-frame yeah. yeah. sign. So, so yeah. that th that's that's a big that's a s something that and uh, maybe this meeting right here is not the pl the the one to talk about it. But I do need some sort of like um, guidance in where I can put signs to direct people to the parking garage, to the Johnson Center, you know, to other other places. We just need more signs where we can put those so that we are not using business parking lots which we are we have a lot of signage there saying you know this is where to go but we, we want to direct them to the Johnson Center so that we aren't using business parking lots so the current at least procedure that we have in place for an event application which she was able to fill out provides a map and asks where signage is being placed and is reviewed by our department and multiple departments so that you know we can make sure that they're meeting whatever ordinances or restrictions UDOT has that are in place. And so that's, that's, that will be part of the process that will hopefully answer that question. So these types of things can be done administratively so this doesn't have to come back to you every year because we've got a smooth, clear process for doing well, that. Well, I was just wondering that. So currently, is the policy in place for a year-long event or for a massive reoccurring event is it currently in place where you can do all that administratively? Does it have to come to council? Do we not have that? The, all, as far as all I can tell, and Paul and Randall can speak to this, there's not other than like on a closed street, administration can improve a street to be closed. That's, that's my level of understanding, but Paul can Signage stuff can be approved administratively already. There's already ordinance on the books to deal with that. Most of these things, we have processes and procedures in place. What makes Heather unique and, and different, sorry Heather, uh, that's not Heather, it's the farmer's market and she's the face of it, is the long-term closure 
and the neighboring businesses. Staff wouldn't do that typically for her farmer's market or any others, and that's when the council came by and said, yeah, let's try it. Well, I'm, I'm still concerned about the, the businesses there. I don't know that I'm hearing that it's positive or that it's negative. I mean, we hear part positive, part negative. I, I would say there's a couple of businesses that are that are that are negative um, a large majority at least that I mean last last uh, well a couple weeks ago at the historic downtown committee um, there were several businesses that came in in support of of it I don't know that I can give you a ratio that it's 95 percent but I can tell you there's three specific businesses and one of them now sold their business to someone else um, so two specific businesses that I know that have been vocal about their concerns. Outside of that, we really haven't heard from other businesses on the negative side of things. So. Are yeah, they on the street or are they on Center Street, the ones that like it, love it? Uh, they, they're, they're on Main, Main Street and Center Street. So if you're on 100 West, then that's gonna be a different impact I think than so. if you're around the corner. Y yes, um, I th a couple of them have But it's doors. interesting, the one, the one business on 100 West is very supportive. The brand new business. Yes, I Ian. Ian oh. uh, from Dipper. She's very supportive. And he started that. And he did start at the farmers market. Um, there, are the the two businesses that um, are unhappy, or um, actually, they can't say that our businesses harm them, but it has not helped them. Um, are both Main Street businesses. Um, the other businesses that are. So they're, they, they so face they're Main Street. They face Main, Main Street. Well, the ones you're adjacent to haven't complained. It's the ones going through right. the block. Okay. That exactly. helps me in quite a bit. Yeah, um, the ones on uh, and ones on 100 West, um, um, including the Levitts, have been very supportive, and then the ones um, on Center Street have been very supportive. That was going to be my one. You brought them up, so I can. I mean, I was questioning. I know they have been in support of it, the Levitts. I was just curious if that support was still there. I mean, yes. it, it is it still there. I received. Talk business wise, they're probably the most affected directly because right. both of their locations are. I received a personal phone call from Mr. Eric, Eric Levitt, who was in full support of this. Okay. Yeah. So I guess my other concern is, and it's been brought up here, and you and I easily could have a conversation about this, um, but, but I, I kind of have the feeling of a farmer's market versus someplace to sell our homemade goods. I guess that's a concern of mine in the respect that what actually constitutes a farmer's market. I mean, and, and I'll be honest, I agree with you. I mean, Heather knows this. I, I think Heather and I actually disagree on what is a farmer's market and what isn't. But that's, I mean, it's just something we agree to disagree well, on. Well, we actually, um, this was this was brought up at the Downtown Alliance meeting uh, a couple months ago. And I actually had, um, I listed three definitions for a farmer's market. And I, I we probably should have brought those. Megan's, she's all over that kind of stuff. But um, there are several definitions for a farmer's market. And the one definition of it being an ex exclusive farmers only market um, basically is kind of obsolete with farmers as well. So because- well, we only have about four farmers that yes, would qualify. Right. Um, we don't have, I mean, we had a total of 14 farmers at our farmers market last year throughout the year. And, and we just don't have enough farmers to be an exclusive right. farmers market. Right. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't mean farmer's market as far as a farm who exclusively, I'm talking about if it's a farmer's market, I would agree that, you know, some individual growing vegetables in their backyard, in our instance, grows way too many onions. So we bring them there to sell. <laughs> yes, exactly. But so I don't, I don't mean a farm, but what I mean you is. You can eat everything that's sold produce, at it. Yeah. That's, that's what I, yeah. I would I would think that a farmer's market is is something that, I mean, as I went yeah. to the last time that I walked through or the two times that I walked through. I'll let Jenny, she wants to talk to you about that. I'll, I just a, a quick comment, Jenny Hendricks. Um, I'm the current chair of the historic downtown economic development committee. Um, also a downtown business and property owner. Also a devoted patron of the farmer's market. And just to address your concern, I hope that we don't get bogged down in the semantics 
of what we call it. Right. We could call it Larry. And it, and it still, and the, the point is, as the, as the downtown committee, we're constantly thinking of how do we get folks downtown? Right. How do we build more traffic downtown? How do we bring pedestrians downtown? The, the farmer's market, whatever you want to call it, single-handedly brings more people downtown and is, a destina is becoming a destination for local folks. It's becoming a destination for tourists, and especially on the Wednesday market. I know Heather's working on some really cool stuff to, to market the Wednesday market. So I just wanted to weigh in and, and, and just reiterate how important it is to our community to have something like this, and, and again, just hope we don't get bogged down in the semantics of what it is called, because it is accomplishing the goal of bringing a lot of folks downtown, getting businesses a lot of exposure, um, yeah. and it's just it's just a very very good thing for our community. So thank you. Thank you. So council, just for some definition, uh, the downtown parking authority, which I know we're using a lot of downtown names. Mm -hmm. It is a uh, quilt work of property ownership. Uh, Cedar City is very fortunate to get to manage that. We love doing it <laughs> with sarcasm. Uh, so we, uh, Ryan Marshall, is over the, the downtown parking authority. It has a committee of business and property owners. Uh, we, we do the maintenance there and the capital uh, improvement of of that parking back there. So it is private ownership of those businesses. We, we do an assessment to operate that and uh, put some aside for capital repair. If um, other non-business owners are going to be parking and using city streets to run business, then uh, perhaps we need to approach the downtown parking authority and see what fee or parking assessment they want to charge or if they're willing to make that available to other private businesses operating down there who are not property owners in the downtown parking authority specific to that entity. Just for clarification, it's both of those parking lots. It's the one behind all of Bullock Drug and then it's also the one further south, south, south right there between behind Centro and Mm -hmm. All that, right? And then so on the, the east side. side. And then huh? the east it's side. It's also on the east side for the downtown parking authority. On the east side of 100 West. No, on no, the no, east on side, side of, side of Main, Main Street. Street. That, those are the ones I'm talking about. On the east side of Main Street. So you're talking oh, about the west side. I was talking, talking about the west side. You're talking about the west side. side. So yeah. For this discussion, side. I'm only talking about the west side. Yeah. I'm talking about the west side. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm good with... Uh, uh, going with the recommendation of the Historic Downtown Economic <coughs> Committee, if you guys are, to yep. move it forward. I am too. Where are you? <coughs> let's let's, let's uh, put this on consent. Yep. Okay, item good. And item number five. Consider a request for refund of water and sewer fees nine, at 965 <coughs> Spruce Street. <coughs> Obring. Uh, Mr. Jeff Obring contacted me prior to the meeting. He's not going to be able to be here, and he doesn't have any representative to speak to this. We'd like to table this item oh. until okay. until a later date. That's fine. <coughs> You'll miss out on this one, Jonathan. I know I'll miss this one. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think you are. I'm going to be watching it. I'll watch on YouTube, yeah, I guess. Right. <laughs> You're going to, hey, yes, will you please unplug his YouTube, your internet connection in your home from... Wednesday nights, so he's not allowed to keep watching videos that happens at city council. Like, come on. Catherine already <laughs> has a five-page list for him, I heard. Turn off the YouTube on Wednesday nights. <laughs> no Tuesday, Wednesday nights for Jonathan. It'll take him three days. Uh, so, okay, let's move on. Do the request. Consent. Thank you. No, oh, we're tabling. Oh, we're, tabling. we're, gonna, we're just going to bring it that. back when Mr. Obering is Fine. available. Got it. Fine. Item number six, public hearing. Consider an ordinance amending Chapter 32-9J1 pertaining to surety bonds for subdivisions and public improvements. Now, here's a guy I can't stay away from city council meetings. Tab, now he gets, has to be here. I've enjoyed this one. 
Uh, Tyler Rommer with Levitt Land. So uh, we're proposing an ordinance change to chapter 32-9. So just a little background. When a developer comes in and uh, requests to develop property and goes through the process, Jonathan will look at what public infrastructure will be going into that and we'll submit a uh, engineer's uh, bonding estimate. He'll look at that and make sure that it looks accurate and then we have two options before we move forward with that. We can either submit a cash bond which the city would hold uh, deposit in the city account. It makes a small amount of interest and then the city would have that as a surety if the developer ever walked away. The other option we have would be to get a letter of credit. Letter of credit is uh, obtained from a bank. Uh, usually the bank ties up uh, capital in order to issue that letter of credit and there's fees and terms that come with that. Those letter of credits usually last for one year at which time they need to be renewed. Um, most times a letter of credit needs to be re renewed which involves additional terms and fees. What we're recommending is to keep those two options, but to add a third option, which would be a surety bond. A surety uh, bond would act similar as a letter of credit, although in this situation, instead of the city going back on the bank and getting those funds to then pay to put in the improvements if the developer walked away, in this situation, the city would go to the surety and say the developer walked away or you know, he won't repair what's been damaged. The surety then steps in, hires the, sub the contractor to come in and fix the infrastructure to the city's um, standard. So that all three we're asking that they, uh, we're not asking that anything be eliminated, only that we add another option to give developers an additional um, tool to satisfy the city's requirement to secure this uh, infrastructure. The other additional thing that I think is beneficial to the city is that surety bonds are in place until the project's completed. So there's no going back. Jonathan and his department isn't having to track letter credits to make sure they get renewed before they expire. So in my understanding, if the, the liability of the city doesn't change, it just gives you one more option to, to work on. Is that That's correct right. from a legal perspective? Well, my understanding too from the Planning Commission uh, presentation is that this used to be an option that the city offered. The city got burned once and, yeah. and took the option away. And so in adding this back in, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a certain standard of, of bond that is uh, where if there is a banking crisis of some sort, these are essentially federally backed. Um, securities so there's there's a lot less risk to the city for the type of grade required correct we're recommending uh, per the ordinance that the surety bonds would have to be acceptable from the US Department of the Treasury which are FDIC backed so there should be additional assurances to the city that they'll be in a just fine position and does that come through then when the developer brings the uh, project in with all the paperwork and everything for permitting. Correct. So that's their responsibility. It's not something the city has to go and seek out and make sure that this guy is. No, we we bring it in. We bring it in to Mr. McCune. He looks through okay. through it and makes sure it complies with the ordinance. Yeah. And yeah, we don't we don't record the plat until they have this. So that's right. the stage where we require it. I'm fine with this. Then. Public uh, hearing. We though. yeah we have a public <laughs> hearing here. We'll I'll open that public hearing. Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing and put that on consent. Consent. And no, we can't. We can't do that. We can't do that. Yep, can't do that. Item number seven. Right. Public hearing to consider ordinances amending the general plan use from open space to central commercial CC, and for zone changes from Highway Services HS to residential single unit R1 and to central commercial. CC for property located at or near 2300 North Main Street. Sintla. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Greg MacArthur. I'm with the Trust Lands Administration. Um, this zone change is just part of a, a land trade agreement we've been working with with the city for the last uh, year or two on it. Uh, this is just kind of one of the final steps, just getting the zone ready for uh, commercial uses in this area. I don't know if you have any questions for me. Yeah. 
gonna make the park possible, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. On the north end. Well, we don't. I mean, yeah, what zones system. could we build parks in? We can build. Yeah. We can build parks in any zone. But right, but, but it's, the it, it's the land yeah, swap. Yeah, but it's the land swap. Park, have to have a place to put it. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> Oh, these work for me. Well, Mr. Yep. MacArthur's up there. You guys should ask him how it is to talk about event permits and try to pass <laughs> it to a city. No, yeah, that was kind of fun to be in the. Going <laughs> on with what we're doing. It was nice to be in the audience as you guys were talking <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah, talk about events. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I. I think this is necessary. We've talked about it for months. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah it's fine. It's a public hearing. We'll open that. Thank you. Hearing, seeing none. No one from the north side going to stand up and hoorah about a park? <laughs> well, they were happy this morning. Uh, we had Good. our meeting. Good. Close the public hearing and we'll put that on action. Put that on action. Item number eight consider cons contracts for construction engineering manage management and materials testing for industrial par road parkway project. Okay, um, <laughs> so this is a project we've been working on for quite a long time as well, the Industrial Road Parkway project. We're getting close to having the design completed. Uh, Mainline Engineering has been working on the design and doing a great job, and that's coming along very well. We're getting to the point now where we're, we need to get things in place to get ready to go out to bid on the project. Um, as part of the federal funding, it requires that there needs to be a construction management consultant that's hired and also a materials testing consultant that's hired. In discussions with uh, Mr. Devin Squire, um, the process for choosing those uh, consultants is based on qualifications. Uh, normally in the city we do more of a, a cost-based uh, proposal that goes out to, or a request for proposals that goes out to consultants. But in this case, it's simply a qualifications-based uh, selection based on a list that UDOT already has for consultants that are pre-qualified. Um, so the consultants that we've we've discussed and would like to recommend are Stanley Consultants for to do the construction engineering management and landmark testing and engineering to do the materials testing and the, the dollar amounts are listed there. Um, these amounts are actually less than what's been uh, estimated previously so we feel like we're getting good value on these. Um, this will free up about another 80000 I think, is what uh, Mainline was estimating that could go towards the construction of the project. So so I think as far as recommending these, we, we feel as staff that this is, these firms can do a good job and provide the quality that we need for the project. And, and this is going to be representative of all phases of the project and as far as relation to projected cost and actual cost, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Actually, I, I want to report. I do want to report because I was had the opportunity to be in the last meeting we had, and we were reviewing all of the specs, and they actually said, we think this project might be under budget. And I said, is there a recording of this meeting? <laughs> <laughs> so an undisclosed person said I was supposed to ask you if you are – Shorter than your young little brother. I had the same <laughs> colleague call me, so we've had the same question. So I'm Devin Squire with UDOT, and <clears throat> I'm going to have to kill my brother. <laughs> not, not really. That's on the record, <laughs> by the way. So <laughs> just punch him. Figuratively. If he's taller than he's pretty tall. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we can put this on <clears throat> consent. You are comfortable with these people, obviously. I am, and they're um, fairly local and uh, provide a really good value to Great. the city. Yeah. Can we put this okay. on consent? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank Item you. number nine. Can I just say real quick uh, how much of yes. a pleasure it's been to work with Jonathan? And right. I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You did. Item number nine, consider vesting extension agreements for water acquisition fees. Hi, H.R. Brown. Um, so we were vested in uh, June 7th of 2022 for the water shares at 16,000, <coughs> excuse me, 100. A little turn in the market, interest rates went up, the project slowed down, and um, we stopped it for a while, about six months, started it back up and realized we've got a June 7th 
deadline or the shares are going to go up. So we're requesting that we pay for the water shares on June 7th and get an extension of six months to pull the, the building permits. Because the way we have it written now is you have to pay within two years and pull the yeah, permit within pull the two permits, years. Yeah. So you want to still pay within the two years, but you don't want to pull the permit within the two years. You want to pull it within six months afterwards. Correct. So it would and be December 7th. And that's all you're asking Probably for not is... a good day. Because I was at Planning Commission. I don't remember the part about the six. So you're only asking for a six-month extension. Six months from the June 7th. From June 7th. So to December 7th. The original ask was for a full extension. Was for a full two years. The well, it was 21 was months, 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 right? Mm -hmm. 21 months was in the document that Randall. Right. Well, and I, I think it does help that, you know, we, we have these vesting ordinances in large part because we don't want subdivisions to sit or, or projects to sit and then, you know, kind of go defunct, change hands several times, and then a decade or two later we're trying to figure things out. Sure. Where you're being proactive, <coughs> where you're imminently looking at that. I, 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 I don't see an issue with a six-month. Um, I, I did want to check with staff. Have we followed up on that um, water revision we did last year? Um, and if that would save them some money as well? Yes, we did. Yeah, we looked at that. That would save actually quite a bit. Um, they provided some comparable uh, water usage from another project that they've that they had done and it would save quite a bit of in terms of the water rights that need to be provided okay. oh so you'll now go under the conservation give you the conservation tier, tier. Conservation yeah, tier. So oh, yeah okay. and one thing i didn't mention in planning is we've been already volleying plans to the city and had red lines back and have sent back to them so we're oh you're we're in the process we're in the process yeah okay yeah. that's good um yeah yeah. I guess the the only other uh, aspect, or are you expecting to have all of the buildings, um, you know, all the permits pulled within the next, you know, within that six month window, or, or yeah, just a that's fraction our goal. of them? Yeah. yeah, you're trying to get them all in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I think that I'm okay with that. So you're going to be pushing. One thing I hope you would consider is uh, if you vest them at a rate that's lower than the rate that we're charging today, or if you extend that. Um, it has an impact on our ability to to buy water. Frankly, I mean the, the rates that he's asking us to vest at are substantially lower than our rates today. I under I <coughs> I do understand that, and I again, this is kind of the you know the spirit of this law is so that the city knows what's coming and we can pay for what's coming and we we know what to expect and where you are being proactive and where uh it is a short extension i'm you know that's where i'm comfortable with this if this yeah. if this was a you know perhaps a different scale like something like an rdo or, or something like that mm -hmm. where it's you know so many uh thousand units over the next 20 years right the vesting process is much d different for that where this is a set number of buildings that you um you came in on uh within the last two years it's a little different so and, and just just to add you know the vesting two years was more than fair you know this has nothing to do with the city at fall this is we economics happened well, and, economics and interest happened. rates went up and sure. it, it shut the, it shut it down for a minute until it became more feasible and, and materials came down and interest rates came down and so it's just a math problem yeah we just have to make careful that we're not saying too much of a precedent because then this could happen with development all across the board mm -hmm. i understand do you know with your with conservation do you know how many acre feet we're talking uh 24.17 yeah it was about 24 so yeah give 24 acre feet yeah okay so it's, it's about 100k difference but we're still going to be getting 300k a little more than that three 360 give or take what do you mean 389 389 in, in, in that what they're paying for water acquisition i do think and i, I want you to know mr brown that i've supported right here i'm right here right here <laughs> sorry i know the voices come from nowhere right um i've supported this project pretty much all the way along i, I just want to make sure that if we were to grant this, and if you did not get all the permits and everything pulled in six months, you would absolutely have to 
come to the new level. You would of have to pay the 20 yeah. six. Six 26. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it were halfway finished, we would allocate what they used and what they didn't, then Correct. we charge the extra price on, yep. on that. Yeah. So the difference of any permits we didn't pull. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's just, not finished, just, just pull the permit. One of the, another one of the purposes of having it only vest for two years is to protect our financial position as we purchase water in the market. Sure. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's also where I'm so just be, please be careful if you do extensions, please be careful on the scope and, yep. and how you do them. Right, and, and that's another spot where I'm, I'm a little more comfortable than I would be otherwise because the rate you vested in is still, even if we're looking at uh, uh, treating all diversion as full depletion water, uh, it lines up almost perfectly with what we just paid for in our last water transaction. So what you're saying, Councilman Melling, is even after we take the haircut, with them paying the 16-1 minus the haircut, it's pretty darn close. We should be able to buy them. So that, that's what we just bought it at. Okay. So doesn't take into consideration stat the overhead to buy those rights, right. but the actual right itself is. <laughs> I think we're going to stop buying land and going vertical and just doing water. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that, did you look at the market to see if you could buy the 20 shares? We've been looking around. Okay. Yeah. You get a pretty serious. I mean. Compared to what you're paying us, if you can go out and buy that many shares at current market rates, you're, you'd save another hundred grand or so. Yeah, I'm, I'm we pretty, have pretty sure there's some for sale out there. Pretty yeah. good incentives for you to yeah, for bring sure. us water rights instead of cash. Yeah, yeah. We've we've paid a lot of money and put a lot of money into this project, so we're, you know, we're we're, we're anxious to see it get started. I am too. I am too. Because I think it'll spur some other activity out there. Yeah. Thank you. You guys think uh, consent or action? <sighs> do we need to think about this more and extension, do extension action or agreement? No, I don't no, think so. so. I'm okay I mean, with what's going to change. Consent, that mayor. It can be on consent. I'm okay yeah. with this on consent because we we discussed the parameters and why this. If if there is any precedent, Councilman you know, Cox, are you comfortable? You were involved in this lengthy discussion at yeah, Planning yeah. Commission. Okay. We had a hundred percent recommendation from the planning commission. Right. Yeah. yeah. I guess the the only thing is is the back end. If they don't pull the permits, we know how that looks. Mm -hmm. It's well written and spelled out. I in think six months. Yeah, we'll just rewrite the agenda item to say a six month. Ex we'll yeah. Make it specifically, only last six months. And then in oh, the and motion, if they don't and, come and in the motion, we can say that <coughs> if they if it is not complete, they would have to vest in. And so if they have they eight have permits to pull in. and they've only paid pulled four. Then we'll give them the vesting in the four, and then we have to renegotiate on the other. Correct. Well, well not, so not so you know, this all. Just they the high high not, yeah, then the you're going to start rate. over. Yeah. Yes. I guess that's that's implied in it, or is it yeah. explicit in the contract? I think it's expressed in there. Okay. If he if he performs within the six months to the extent he performs, he performs, and if he doesn't, he doesn't. Yeah. If he doesn't, well, he doesn't. Well, that would be on the concern that we're protected on that back end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're taking this to December fifteenth, essentially. Mm -hmm. was Seventh, huh? December December seventh. Well, yeah. Arbor Day. Yeah. 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 Can we do eighth? Can we do the eighth <laughs> or the sixth? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's don't have anything <coughs> sink, okay? Yeah. I say we put this on consent. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Page two. Thank you. Item number ten. Consider deferral agreement for master plan public improvements required for the Diamante subdivision phase two. Yeah, I'm Kirby Stratton. Well, you're not Mr. Platt. <laughs> uh, Mr. Platt, he can't be here because he's teaching a class. Uh. So for now, this is just the deferral. This is not talking about the master plan. Correct. Moving That's it. This is just the deferral. Yeah. Just the deferral. Yeah, that master. P it, it went to sketch. When is it on planning commission's agenda? Uh, it will be probably the first meeting in May. Okay. So I want to go deferral now so I can start the project. Right. That's where I'm at. With, with yeah. Me. And I, I guess, um, I mean, we asked staff to get this on the agenda for this week and fast track it. So I, I yes. think, um, I think I know where you know this aspect is going to go. But um, Councilman Cox brought up a good point that I think we need to look at it uh, with Pull the, up the county with the yeah with the county yeah, GIS as as we're looking at the right away. the general plan alignment there is a dedicated road just south of there where the, the cedar, yeah, cedar city rv owns directly east coming off of center street right there 
it lines up with Hidden Hills. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no. It, it's almost lined up with Hidden Hills. We'd have to do something with the university there, but... Um, oh, no, that's not the same... Right there. So that, click on that one right there. Um, that is owned by the city, the, the one that it's already a dedicated, a road dedicated um, to the city, so it doesn't make sense to run it clear up to those top two lots and back down. Yeah, that's kind um, of what I In I'm my saying. mind, I, the, the uh, Hidden Hills, if you go south, the Hidden Hills is already, no, it's not quite that, yeah, there it is. That Hidden Hills is already, uh, isn't that the one that's 60 feet wide that was originally? 66, yeah. And to be the center street. And you can come off that little triangle and still make a good cross T if you angles, see where it says 200 south, go left. Right there, the city owns that, to come and make that mm -hmm. uh, a good crossway that way. But um, that's not on the center street, though, is it? It is. Oh, it's well, it's, it's on to 200, 200 south. Oh, that's 200 right. center street. Oh, no, up we're up here. Yes, up here. The, same, the same thing. It's the... No, see, they don't line up. You'd have an offset of intersection. Yeah, you'd, ha you'd have some offset of an intersection. But even here, if you go north a little bit, um, I believe the... Uh, as it's currently master planned, um, that the, the parcel to the north is Mr. Stratton's. And um, that alignment is just right south of there, and so if even if that road were to come down, it's it's got to line up with Center Street again eventually, right? As, I think as it planned. Goes down. And so I it's I don't down further. Yeah, it would come down. Right, and so if there's a pointer there, if you need to use. However, it. we align it. It's it's going to go down that way, and it's really not going to service this development. We're talking here. Your right. curse is up there. We're talking here. Here's my okay, property it, line. Right. It, it's going to bypass all that. Center Street. The other concern, if you, you go farther north, is it's really close to 56 to have that intersection. So you'll have two kind of major intersections that are pretty close. You mean up there, Westview and, and 200 north? Yep, 50, yeah. yeah, 200 north, 56. So where are you recommending to put it? I'm still confused. Down off of Hidden Hill? Well, or that or make the, it come in there and then go out Hidden Hills, and so you don't have a T intersection. So you're saying you just you drive on Westview uh -huh. for just drive on Westview and then hit the center again, or bend it up around that where it says the cinema Cimarron, bend it up over that Cimarron right there because that's where it comes in anyway. Cimarron is just super steep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean you Cumber's could you could go a little farther north. north. I just don't understand why we've gone so far north because your topography is about the same. When you get from the bottom where it starts to go up, other than that one little canyon right there, that's pretty steep. And the change came in because of those subdivisions on the east side of Westview. So they were trying to make the road go up behind our property and connect up that way. So nobody was thinking about the left side of Westview, the west side, mm -hmm. when they did this. Um, and so that's the issue is we obviously let these neighborhoods come in with that road having been moved. Yeah. So now to try and put in a, a larger master plan road through those areas is going to be much more difficult. Um, the only thing that I would know the burden to them because they didn't want to put it through theirs. That's that's my only hang up with this is, it, you know, is hey let's just draw a line and willy nilly and whoever's the unlucky one gets to pay for the road. Um, and, and that I was why Mr. Wilkie presented and you guys approved a change in that so that at least the affected parties will now be part of that conversation. The only thing, again, I would note on this one is as helpful as the conversation is, remember that is not what we have today. It is just yeah. to get him to that point. Because yeah. right. this will right. come yeah. back to you with all those neighbors able to come in and talk to you about why they think one location is better than another. But, and the only reason I want to bring this up is, is so that we could publicly talk about the city owns that road and it comes right, right <coughs> off of Center Street and it doesn't make sense to, to tie into that and to me, and, and especially that close to 200 North. So. Well, especially if we get the improvements on Westview Drive, they may have to go off that a while and then just yep, yep. go back on. Yep. Mm. Well, but we'll see. Obviously. Back to Mr. McCune's point, I think for the deferral, I don't think there's any question for many of us that the deferral needs to happen for now, correct? Yep. Can I just bring up one thing in case you have an interest or didn't notice? So typically when we do a deferral agreement for a subdivision, it's, it's a burden on the entire subdivision. In this case, he has requested, and it's been drafted that way, to only, theoretically, two burden two lots. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <coughs> it can create a difficulty if the road remains, because then it's two property owners that now have to deal with the entire expense instead of Correct. a shared expense. Uh, I know we've had at least one variance to the Board of Adjustments because we missed one in 
99, I think, where we didn't widen part of a road with the subdivision. We signed off on it for some reason. And that private owner's like, why do I have to do this all myself? So that's the only thing I would bring up because we don't normally do that. So if you're granting this, just know as it's worded, you would be granting that request. Are you selling these properties? <laughs> yes. And the reason I want it this way is because, uh, you know, obviously it's got to be disclosed as a deferral agreement. It's going to be easier for me to discount two lots when, when I sell them that they're going to at some point have the possibility of doing those improvements rather than affecting the sales of all my lots I already have names on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, and that's the back okay. side of your lot. The, you en you're entering from the other side, right? Correct. And yeah. so it's yeah. And so I don't see why everybody should have to pay for that when it only affects two lots. And well, yeah, usually it's just because it's the developer that has to pay for it, not the individual lot. Owner. Yeah. But th th they'll be sold knowing, you know, that it's going to be attached. Yeah, to they'll have to know the, that. With the county assessor or whatever, that, that, that deferral agreement will be attached to those lots when they sell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm good with putting this on consent. Okay, thank you. Yeah. One other question I have. Go ahead. I know I can't be here next week. Do I need to if you're on consent, I think you're clear to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't need consent to be is here. we take all the things on consent Less and put them as one block. We put, them, things, we so. put a big lump sum at the first, and okay. so far I've been hanging around here for two and a half years, and I've never seen it. Okay, yeah. Not get approved. Be like doing this anyway, so <laughs> just want to make sure. All right, thanks for your Thank you very much. <coughs> item, item number 11 and 12 and 13 are all the same project. Public hearing to consider ordinance accepting the annexation of 10.66 acres of land located at approximately 1711 West 3000 North. Also public hearing to consider an ordinance amending the general plan used from medium density residential to high density residential for and for zone changes from annex transition to dwelling single unit R21 and dwelling multiple unit R3M or for a property located at or near 1711 West 3000 North and to consider a development agreement <coughs> limiting allowed uses for a property located approximately 1711 West 3000 North. been watching you guys on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes so this is just the uh, Doug and Nikki Hershey annexation out on 3000 North and Jim Lime Meadows and the mayor basically said it all <laughs> I don't know what I you want me to read. repeat <laughs> that's good enough you. takes the words out of my mouth <laughs> I have a couple of questions but if there's anything else you wanted to oh. so Correct me if I'm wrong on this, Randall, but I've read through this. So in my understanding, <coughs> the whole parcel we're taking to high density, master planned, and then we're rezoning part of it R21, part of it R3M. I did not see it in the uh, development agreement, but I could have missed it. Where we're taking the whole thing master plan to high density and it's not in the development agreement, is there anything that would stop the developer from coming back and changing all that R21 to R3M in the future, knowing that it's already master planned high density? The development agreement says how many he can build in the R21, but it doesn't say that it has to stay R21. That would be my biggest concern. That's a good catch, Councilman Wilkie. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, I didn't know. I, I couldn't tell from it. When I look at the few the points, that's right? I, I assume it wasn't set up that But I wasn't sure. It's only a one section, right? Where one more page, I believe. So, right there. I mean, here's the main, the main things. It says the project will contain the maximum count of 38 in the R21. And that the R3M or the R3 will be R, will be 32, but I just don't see it anywhere in there that it specifies that the R21 has to stay R21. And once we've already given them the master planned or the general plan density of high density, what's stopping them from coming back and changing the R21 in the future to R3M? Well, in, in the end, and, and we can make it more explicit. But if you read that small Roman numeral I. 
if they change anything from the R2 residential dwelling single unit, technically they wouldn't be able to build anything in it. Because um, this agreement is only authorizing them to build in those two specific zones. The, but the I can spell it out if you wish and have I an mean, extra line. The general plan amendment is only for a it's portion for, of it. It's only for the R3 yeah, portion. that's only part of it, not the rest of it. Oh, the general plan amendment is only for the R3M portion? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, and again, I, I apologize on some of that. That's I warned you on some of the mapping. I thought it was the for mapping. the whole piece. Yeah, some of the mapping well, no, is, shape, we'll get updates for you. Oh, yeah, this. Yeah. There was okay. some. I thought it showed, said that. Okay, so if the general plan amendment is for only the R3M piece, then my question is null and void, and we're good. Yeah, I thought that was Mr. Good. Wilkie, if you'd love to give us the whole piece at R3, we won't object. No, I just, <laughs> I, I, that would be a diff more difficult uh, thing. So one thing we are doing, though, and correct me if I'm wrong, by doing this, we are set, we are multi-zoning one parcel, correct? Which we haven't, there's been conflicting in the past, because they're not separate parcels. We're, so... We're, we're multi-zoning one parcel. Our, our complaint on that, if you've heard us complain about in the past, is multi-zoning a lot. Because we expect a single lot to be used okay. one way. I guess, way. yeah, on a big parcel. It's in a parcel, we expect them to subdivide it before well, they can use that's it. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. My only other question, and I did some math, and I'm somewhat of a good mathematician, but not the best in the whole world. The the piece that stayed, uh, the, the one that here shows the where the house is the house is staying there yeah so I did the calculation so the piece that is going to be actual r21 is not 8.41 acres because the 8.41 acre calculation includes where the house is correct I would assume so. I would yeah so you're using the houses you're using the the property that the house is on in your total thing and I did the calculations but if um, so, so the piece that is just going to be R21, not including the house, that piece is actually 6.49 acres. So then if you take out, if you take 38 homes, times that by 7,000 square feet per lot, it ends up coming out that there's only 16,000 square feet left over total for all the roads. And so for all the roads in the six acres. So I guess I'm just asking, that's okay to include the property that they're not going to be using in their calculation. I just feel like that the property where the house is sitting on, they're getting the benefit of that acreage, but they're not building on that acreage. Well, that's why the cluster says it is in the report. But this isn't a cluster, is it? Is it? This isn't under the new cluster ordinance, is it? So they haven't subdivided yeah, anything. Okay. That's you don't the know problem. how they're going to subdivide. subdivide. If they do, then they just need to m Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And when they actually subdivide it, it's going to have to meet all the criteria. Yeah. Okay. And, that if, was it, I was and if it doesn't, it's okay. Well, you got to take one house out. If they can't fit them on there, then they can't. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And again, but, but, those are, but those are good questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. So, you know, and I've actually, you know, I've been asked about this project before, and actually, I don't necessarily have. I mean, it's kind of spot zoning technically because there's no other R3M right there. But I don't necessarily have a problem with it, where it's just one part of it. Is that south? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Gemini Meadows. Does it go right up to Gemini Meadows? The wall. Yeah, those right? houses. The yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that touches yeah. the. Those are yeah, all. I drove out there the other day and looked at it. Right there, so. Yeah, so it's similar. Several zones. You're, yeah, I think this makes sense. You know, you're you're not going to want to put single-family homes on three thousand north. Well, they are. This will have single-family homes. Well, there's one. <laughs> well, this is this is the town homes. This is the single family. So yeah, the single families well, will be on three thousand. But isn't the right there? Side, the south is Gemini. The well, north is side 3, is three thousand. Right. North. Isn't the house right there in the yeah. orchard? The existing house is yeah. right here. Yeah. And, but this is the whole project. So you'd have the single family right oh, there. Oh, single West family. Yeah. Again. Okay. I'm sorry. So I should say just, not, not our one. Not, not our one. Fronting it. Yeah. Yeah. There will be. Various comments. On you guys yeah. are making Renan's life slightly more difficult. Sorry, by Renan. Three <laughs> conversations at the same time. Yeah. No, my biggest concern, and I apologize. I was, I should have caught that. But yeah, if the if the master plan changes for just that piece, then I'm good. No other questions. It's a public hearing. Should we open it? Now, yeah, have comments sure. from the public. Uh, two of them are public hearings. The third one is not. But let's open them both right here. Okay, seeing none. Oh. 
I thought you were going to have a comment. That was a very interesting moment to choose to stand up. <laughs> 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 okay. I just waited to hear what this was about because I'm always concerned when you're changing something to high sure. density housing and Clark yeah. to cha and changing something, how it affects everybody living there because we've had some things where we seem that we don't care really too much how it affects everybody living there. And my other thing about it is I think we need something in the city that we mean. You know, if we're, we're going to zone something some way, then let's keep it zoned that way so people know what they can plan on. So having alfalfa. said that, throughout what? We'd steal all the alfalfa fields throughout this valley if we didn't accept some change. It does have to this change. It does have to yeah. accept some change. But I'm saying when you're, when you're, ha when you're planning mm -hmm. where people are going to build their homes or build whatever they're, you know. Pretty similar to what's out there. Okay, it's that's what I, that's what I, that's why I wasn't going to say anything. And, and because you said it was similar, so I kind of went, okay. It plan. It's, not, it's not similar. It's almost exactly to what's already The out. general plan has this as twin homes. So this yeah. takes yeah. that and separates it to so townhome and single family yeah. and, so and single no family, twin homes. Which is a step up from that. Yeah. So, so that's why I, I was just leaving because I heard it and I thought, <laughs> okay, it's similar. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. You surprised us a little bit. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing, and this matter <laughs> will be on action. action because we have ordinances. Correct? Okay. Thank you. I believe so. And just also one other question, because I guess this is the way we're doing things going forward. We annex and zone at the same time now? Because did before we kind of was one step and... Our, our ordinance actually encourages us to decide the zone at the time of annexation. Don't get me wrong. I like it that way. The, the AT zone is if we don't do that. It's just a fallback. It's a transition. Okay. I just feel like that's how it's been done for a long time with the AT. You're not wrong. Okay. Well, a lot of people just didn't know what they wanted to do yet, and so they just brought it in, exactly. and we waited. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Stay down there. No, <laughs> we've had them all we can. We just keep them out all we can. Yeah, just keep them going. The development agreement included in all that? Yes. Yeah. Last thing I'd just say here, and I, yeah, I know it's already been repeated, name. but I just want to make sure everyone understands with this, I think that this is going to be a great project because nothing against duplexes or twin homes, but if this is annexed according to the general plan without this consideration, it would just be a whole bunch of more Gemini Meadows, and I'm not saying that's good or bad or whatever, but with doing this, this allows flexibility to actually have um, more affordable uh, entry-level single-family homes, and that having the, the R3 there, that's going to help to fund the infrastructure, specifically when you look at the amount of infrastructure that we're going to have to put in along 3000 North, it's going to be pretty substantial. So we, we feel that this is, this is something that will allow us to accomplish the objectives that we're really trying to do, I think, as a community um, to, to promote the, the things that we need for our local people. You still need to, you probably want to state your name for the record. You didn't when you started. So it's Spencer Jones, and I have this property under contract. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 14. Incidentally, there, there will be a break here. We, some of these are fairly heavy projects coming forward, so we will have a break when Wendy gets we your vegetables thing. here. Consider item number 14. Consider a BLM right-of-way application for this, the Cedars at Cedar Trail subdivision. So this is a project um, regarding the Bridget Cedar Trails subdivision. Dave Clark called me today. He couldn't make it to the meeting, so I, I told him that I would discuss this with the council. Um, basically what this is, is in order to provide services for the subdivision, they need to bring in some offsite utilities from the north. Um, this is located just at the south end of Church Canyon Drive at the south end of the Southern View subdivision. This is the location where the BLM trailhead is, where it, where the bike trails take off from. This, this is where we just realign the master plan road? Yes, okay. yeah, exactly. Um, a few years ago, the city came in and put in a storm drain pipe at the south end of Church Canyon Road. Um, that area had eroded quite badly, um, and so there needed to be some improvements done there. And so the one easement coming that runs kind of off to the southwest that's where the existing storm drain pipe is located. And then 
as so is that just for the pipe the easement is that just for the pipe yes that's just for the storm drain pipe and then there's another e easement that's proposed going west that's for a master planned water line um, so both of those easements would be included in this right-of-way application um, the city needs to make the application because the city is going to be the one actually owning and up and maintaining the utilities after they're installed of course the one the storm drain's already installed but the, the water line is proposed to be installed as part of the subdivision um, also as part of this application um, they're proposing to fill in this uh, existing wash that area has um, eroded out quite badly as well um, they're proposing to bring in pit run and fill that back in and bring it up back up to grade so that this drainage can continue west um, I did have a conversation with the BLM today they're looking at doing some additional improvements rather more than just filling it in they'd also like to put some armoring on that um, in that channel so that it doesn't erode in the future um, we talked about some options um, about either riprap or some kind of or a concrete lining through that through that uh, wash area um, the BLM would like to have a little bit more conversation on that before uh, making a final decision on exactly what that's going to look like but in terms of uh, submitting the application the application would be for filling up that that area and that would be at the expense of both the BLM and the, and the developer I'm not sure exactly how they're going to work out that arrangement to do that but um, but that wouldn't it, we point. wouldn't be involved in that any financial way on that wash right I, I don't know yet I don't know yet um, there was some discussion about possibly having the city provide some of the material but that was again that was just a discussion I had today with the BLM but in terms of where we're at right now it would be the developer and the BLM that would need to work that out okay well you answered my question I want to know why we were making the application rather than the developer but you answered it so thank you yeah yeah the city needs to make the application well I I would say let's put this on consent then and um, my only comment on this would be uh, Jonathan after 23 years in the city and having been hired by Joe Melling you still say it wash okay yeah, and, not, not, <laughs> and, not, and not wash wash, wash. wash. yeah and, and there, there's no R in wash <laughs> but he's not from officially uh -huh. from Cedar City he is a transplant Right. Wow, but 20, so 23 years. I you you got to learn the lingo. It's the war. <laughs> Virginian. Yeah, Good on you, Jonathan. Good, Good on you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's, we put this on consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. Yep. Item number 15. Consider a variance to the city engineering standards for a driveway location, 2610 North Canyon Ridge Drive. And there's, there's two pieces. Consider amendment to the city traffic ordinance. To establish no parking zone in the vicinity of 2610 North Canyon Richard Drive. Okay, Mike Platt with Platt and Platt Engineering, and I I don't want you guys. I hate starting off this way, but don't take this the wrong way. Why do we have a master plan road in Main Street, and then less than 300 feet away we got a master plan road in Canyon Ranch Drive? That that's where the whole issue comes comes to play because we have to stay within 150 feet of either one of those entrances we don't have that no matter if we go to the left the west or to the east so to get traffic off of main street and into the future development we're requesting that we have this right in right out pork chop deal that was the same variance that was given to terribles who's just right across the street so our hands are tied to get people off of main street to develop main street we have to use this little variance right here with the pork chop to get people in and out well I, I won't take that the wrong way but uh, the the master plan road there was done long before we were on the council I know I know okay. it's the guy before I meant the city and not not you guys in particular mm -hmm. but the city I, I, I and so as we were looking at it, I said it doesn't make sense to do it like that but here we are this is where we're at and this is how we have to get traffic in and out and well, the reason is because you don't want to allow any, any more accesses off Main Street. Well, I know that. So that's why that road's there. Um, I, I, I agree with that. And I think if 
Is you dumb guy still here? No. <laughs> oh, believe me. That's we give them guys party. way <laughs> too much power, and, and that's why the North Interchange, anything on the North End doesn't, we don't have any development out there. We're letting them dictate. We do have some good things going. This building right here, if, if we end up going vertical, which we hope, we can, again, not trying to put you in a duress, but we have signed leases with Starbucks and Johnny Max. If any of you know what Johnny Max yep. is, they're in Vegas. I do. Um, they're great. Yeah. They've been in business for 45 years. They're, uh, his son, <laughs> uh, without <laughs> saying local names, his son was um, a manager of one of the busiest restaurants <laughs> here for a number of years. Uh, we built that restaurant um, there probably 12 years ago or so, and so the sun's coming to to uh, to run this. So it'll be Starbucks and Johnny Max. What I want to make sure is, and I, and I've talked about this with Councilman Mellon, and I think I clearly understand what you're requesting because we just did it two or three months ago. I just don't want to develop a situation where we have the Starbucks on the south end of town because that is a mess. And I don't want that to happen when this is built or 20 years from now. Well, I agree. And then, but, but who do we hold responsible? You don't. They're the, they're the ones that designed well, that south interchange. I'm well, not, but I'm no, not the, you don't, but I'm just the developer the developer did all that uh, land there with the buildings, not not the diamond. But, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Spencer, excuse me just one second. Ryan, will you go help my wife in the parking plaza with those pizzas? Back to you. <laughs> Thank you. You timed the pizzas perfect. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so all the, the access will be coming in here and entering in here. This port, because of this pork chop and because of this, this road issue here, this pork chop, is, this, this will be more of an right in, right in, right out. Exactly. So no one can turn left there anyway. So, so we keep the queue going the long way, and if the traffic gets, you know, I mean, we got a big, really big queue here. This lines up with that entrance. So, so they would come out of the drive-through and they immediately turn right. go right, right, and they're out of there. So I don't, I don't want to place blame on anybody because we're all here to work together and solve yep. problems. And this is just one issue. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes we create the problem. Yeah, we start paying attention. We saw they had wings. <laughs> we were looking at Johnny Max menu. It looks. Good. I uh, <laughs> I don't I don't see a problem with this. I think this is something we need to do uh, to make the development work, and I think this is probably the safest way to do it. Um, and this is for my my two cents. I I think it's the same thing with the parking. We need to make sure there is no parking there on both sides because. I, those big trucks out there now are very, very difficult to see around. Now, loves may not be happy with that because those drivers are going to have to move further to the west or some other place. But I do think that's what we ought to be doing. So I'm, I'm in favor of this proposal. Thanks for your support. I, I purchased this property here probably, I don't know, 12 months, 18 months ago. Uh, it's a very substantial investment. We own all the property going down to the um, farm credit agency, that little building mm. down on the corner. Mm -hmm. So we have all that on Main Street. So th this, we're wanting to make sure it's the right tenants, the yep. architectural design, the traffic patterns, everything like that. It'll kind of set the tone to have a nice place going south. There will be, total, it's a total of three tenants though, right? You don't know who the middle one is, but there is one more tenant. Yeah, th there's a, there's a, uh, there is a space there in the middle um, for a gotcha. third tenant. Well, this will set the tone, as you said, so future <coughs> developments to the south will come along because these are substantial, well-branded uh, businesses. Yeah. So I'm good. I'm good with it. Thank you very much. Um, How about you guys? Yeah. I believe I those are quiet. <laughs> that's good to go. Those I'm pretty sure if we say no, the people on the north. Can we put it on consent? No. Nope. Because I need to abstain on it. Oh. Yep, that's correct. So it has to be action. I don't need to. It's just politically no, no, expedient. You yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. grateful that you are. You can't not that. vote on all the consent. No. Yeah. No, that's correct. Sam, I apologize. We're going to talk for quite a while about your project, I'm oh, sure. Oh, man, you poor guy. And so, Jeez. but we will have you, everyone here, please come get some pizza. I 
the crowd was much larger when I ordered six pizzas. So every, everybody's gonna, it's got, everybody's gonna take home pizza. But you can each eat half a pizza. Randall's hungry, so we are there. We are adjourned for 10 minutes while we eat pizza. Thank you, Hi, Wendy. I know. You need to put. You need to put. Yes, they got said wings. Wendy, the other skin. way. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. We could have wings. Too. I don't know how to pause this, by the way. So uh, don't, don't, say don't say anything. Don't say anything. Yeah, don't say anything obscene. Yeah, because if I do anything, it's just going to create a whole new one. So if it's anything you don't want on YouTube, let's step outside. Yeah, that's <laughs> really cool. I'm only going to take two minutes. I just want the wings. So. <laughs> We've got three heavy projects to do. Maybe I'll just do that. That'll be easier. Let me just do that. Step in my hand.